Um, next, we have a list of folks who have signed up to testify for H2294 and S1444. Again, this is Chair Garbley and Chair Gobi's bill and act granting equal access to original birth certificates to all persons born in Massachusetts. Um, I'll just remind everybody testifying, we do have a three minute limit preferred uh, so that we can make sure to hear all the testimony today. Um, so I'll call uh, folks one at a time and then we'll take questions um, if they arise after the testimony. First, please, Sarah, Sarah Neville. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Sarah. My name is Sarah Neville and I live at 40 Eleanor Street in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate in social work at Boston College and I'm also an adoption researcher. I myself am not adopted, but my parents have adopted two of my siblings. And when I was 19 years old, um, my mom revealed to me that before I was born, she placed a child for adoption, her own biological child. So for my mom, she was faced with an unexpected pregnancy in the late, 18, uh, in the late 80s. And um, my mom's parents encouraged her to hide her pregnancy by living in a maternity home run by a Catholic adoption agency. My mom had decided that placing the baby for adoption was for the best, um, but she had no choice in the circumstances of the adoption. She really wanted to have a relationship with the baby's parents, the baby's adoptive parents, but the nuns told her no. What she needs to do is put this all behind her and forget it ever happened. And that would be best for her so she could move on and forget all about it. A few years after that, she tried to um, send the adoptive parents a letter, but the social worker um, who handled her adoption refused to send it completely. She just said, nope, I won't send it. My mom has been searching for my half sister for some years now, and she has had no success. Um, I support this bill as an adoption researcher and a social work researcher, and my mom supports it as a birth mother. I'm telling her story to illustrate the fact that birth mothers were not promised anonymity. <laughs> and, um, an, anonymity, sorry. The high, it was the higher ups in adoption agencies who thought that secrecy and sealing birth certificates was the best way to protect adoptive parents from the interference of anyone else, such as um, such as birth mothers. This bill doesn't force anyone to contact anyone else or to have a relationship with anyone else. It just gives adopted people the right to their own personal information. And if those adoptees contact a birth family member, then those individuals are perfectly free to turn them away and not not respond to them. So I urge you to report favorably on this bill, but more than that, I really implore you to please use your influence um, this session to get this bill on the floor for a vote um, because this bill has, you know, died in three consecutive sessions, not because it really has any opponents, but just because it's been passed over by the legislature. So I'm asking you to please, please um, do everything you can to grant adopted people their rights this session and um, get this bill to pass. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for combining your personal story with your professional expertise. Um, very grateful for the context you offered. Questions for Sarah? Okay, we'll take a few more and Sarah, if you stay, they may arise. Um, uh, I'd like to call Margaret Hendrick, please. Margaret, are you with us? I'm looking. Okay, I don't see Margaret right now, um, but if Margaret returns, we will put her in. Um, Jean Strauss, please. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Can Jean, thank you. Can you see me okay, great. Um, first off, I wanna thank Senator Comerford very much for your leadership on this issue, uh, not just today, but 
in the last session. We really appreciate being able to speak with you all. Um, so I'm from East Brookfield and I'm an adoptee, but more important, I'm a, an author and a filmmaker. I've been documenting this issue for uh, over 30 years across the country, the need for adoptees to have access to their original information. I'm not just past filmed the passage and the enactment of legislation, but also I followed adoptees and their families sometimes for months or even years following their receipt of birth certificates. And I think this long-term study allows me to assure all legislators that these bills are vital to the emotional and physical well-being of your constituents. So I've lived in Massachusetts much of my adult life, but actually I was born and adopted in California. And something happened this year that um, underscored for me the need for records. Um, my birth mother died in July from COVID. And it was an incident that sparked in me the desire to finally apply for my own birth certificate. There is, records are sealed in California, but there's a process where you can just file an application. So um, I decided to do that. My birth mother and I had known each other for 33 years. And although she didn't replace the mom who raised me in any way, we had a profound friendship. So I filled out the requisite form. Um, and sent it along with 40 pages of supporting documents, including a notarized permission form my birth mother had signed. Um, and of course, I anticipated that it could get turned down. Um, I mean, I've been doing this for decades. <laughs> Anybody that's in this room right now could tell you we've watched people um, be turned down for their request for information. But when the clerk of the court from the county where I was born called me this past December to inform me that my application was not enough, then instead, and instead I would have to pay $425 to file a formal court case that I would need to hire a lawyer, that I would need to fly to California to be in court in person simply for the chance, not the guarantee, but the chance that they might let me have my original birth certificate. Um, I couldn't help it. I wasn't expecting it, but I burst into tears. And I sobbed on the phone to this clerk. It, it reminded me, even though I'd witnessed it, it's so different when it happens to you personally. Um, I was devastated and I, it was diminishing and dehumanizing, and I am 66 years old. When will I be old enough to have access to a document that any other citizen can file a form for and get? Um, you know, when will I be considered a good enough citizen to be given that privilege? What do I have to do to be equal to them? Because equality is the question on the table today. Um, and I'm so proud of Senator Gobi, by the way, for sponsoring this bill, because I am one of her constituents, and she's the kind of legislator everybody wants to have uh, as their senator or their state rep. Uh, she listened and she took time to educate herself about the need for equal access to all. And, and uh, Representative Garbally, uh, who I got to know last session, is just amazing, as is Representative Hogan. So I hope the committee moves this forward, and as Sarah said, doesn't just help us get this through committee, but helps us get it onto the floor. And in doing that, I know for sure that these citizens in Massachusetts that are between the ages of 21 and 47 who are denied access, you will be providing them not only with the equality that they deserve, but the dignity, the humanity, and the respect that they need to feel like they're full citizens of this commonwealth. I now know this again from personal experience, and I feel it in my heart. I thank you very much. Thank you, Jean, uh, so much for sharing your testimony. I share your love for Ann Gobi as a Senate colleague. Um, she's a rock star for sure, as yep. is Chair, Chair Garbally. Um, thank you also for sharing your personal stories. Questions for Jean. Um, Jean, just like Sarah, questions may arise. Um, so if you hang around, you may get a question as we move through folks testifying. Um, deeply grateful for your leadership on this issue. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Brenda Cotter, please. Thank you, Brenda. Hi, can you see and hear me okay? You're good to go. All right, thanks. Um, it was my greatest fear to follow Jean Strauss, who is one of the most articulate voices on the uh, adoption rights, but anyway. You are uh, really welcome here. <laughs> My name is uh, Brenda Cotter and I'm an adoptee. I was adopted in 1956 um, and I'm also an adoptive parent of two grown daughters. Um, I'm also a lawyer 
uh, that cares deeply about civil rights and equality. Um, and I think from, I look at this issue from all of those perspectives. Um, and I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today on this. Um, so Gloria Jean St. Peter is my original name. Um, I know this because I was able to obtain my birth certificate um, back in the day. Um, but in Massachusetts, most adoptees, those born between 74 and 2008, cannot access their birth certificates. Um, and I and many others, some of whom you see here today, have been working uh, for years to try to eliminate this gap um, with repeated bills that have been filed and um, just haven't made it over the finish line for various reasons. Um, in my advocacy to date, I focused on education and I've tried to persuade people to reflect on how they would feel if they were denied access to their own vital records, their own birth certificates. Um, I've tried to make the case a call to empathy in a reasonable, logical way that adoptees, all adoptees, um, should have the same civil rights and the same equality um, as every other Massachusetts citizen. Um, and I've been careful to reassure um, those that may be nervous that, um, yes, I love my family and no one who wants to know their own history is indicating that they're troubled or lacking in loyalty. Um, it's simply a matter of wanting to know one's own identity um, in its various uh, forms. Um, recently, I observed the reactions to um, a fantastic article that was written by journalist Steve Inskeep in the New York Times in March, and I urge anyone interested in this issue um, to read it. It was March 2021. Um, and he talked about his own story. He's obviously been a journalist for decades, and he talked about advocacy for open records and what that meant to him. Um, most people who responded to that article, it was a long article, were very supportive. But, you know, a few weighed in, um, and the main few were sort of were concerned about birth parents' privacy. Um, but, I mean, it's important to say that the only national birth parent organization in this country that's been around uh, for as long as I've been interested in this issue, decades, 100% um, supports open records. Um, I really think that these privacy concerns that get stated are usually from maybe a very, very small group of adoptive parents who might be a little scared or a little threatened that their children um, will some, it'll affect their relationship with, with their parents. Um, but I, you know, I'm here to say there's no reason to be threatened. Um, I found my birth parents back when I was 20, which is a long time ago, um, and it didn't have any effect on the love that I have for my family and really only helped uh, to make me feel more secure in my identity. Um, and amazingly, one of my daughters uh, found her birth parents in China which is astonishing. Um, it's hard to do. Um, and in our family, that experience and supporting her through that experience really only brought more love into our family. Um, and it, you know, for both of us, for her, for sure, and for me, um, it just having that information about your beginnings is it's so critically important. Um, it's, I almost can't explain probably any adoptees on this panel know how, how that feels. It's kind of just answering the questions that we have about where did I come from? How did I even get on this planet? Um, so this is a um, very simple bill uh, and you know, see of complex problems that we have to solve in this world. It's really something really so simple to solve. Um, literally this gap group of adoptees is the only ones that don't have rights to a birth certificate. Everybody else does, every other citizen. Um, that's not equality. Um, and you know, how basic can, is it a question of civil rights to have your own vital records? Um, and as Jean said, there's something kind of humiliating or strange about not being able to access literally your own birth certificate. Um, so Gloria Jean St. Peter, uh, that is my original name. I don't use it. Um, but I lived in that name for six months, um, and that type of information should not be kept from me or for, from anyone else. And I guess I would say that, you know, adoption should not be like the witness protection program. It shouldn't really function that way. 
Um, so I urge you to support House Bill 2294, Senate Bill 1440. Um, and thank you very much uh, for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate hearing from other people about this. Thank you so much, Brenda. Really appreciate your testimony. Can you make sure to send in that article that you referenced, the Steve Inscape article? Send it in Absolutely. to the testimony. Um, thank you. We'll make sure that the committee sees it. Um, thank you. I just re respectfully remind folks just to try to keep that testimony in the three minute limit uh, so that we can hear from everybody today. Um, uh, welcome now to Tito Jackson. Tito, are you with us? Okay. Um, perhaps Tito will come back to us. Um, welcome Adam Kurtman, please. I saw you in the chat, Adam, so I know you're here. Adam? I was muted, I apologize. Very good, thank you. Um, my name is Adam Pertman. I am a resident of Newton, Massachusetts, and I head the National Center on Adoption and Permanency, which is a national education or organization. I should say education research because that's where I'm going to start. Um, we've heard for over a year how important it is to follow the science, follow the evidence, follow, follow what we know to be true. I've been studying this issue in particular and many, many others relating to adoption for going on 20 years. Um, now in my role at NCAP and before that at the Donaldson Adoption Institute, which did seminal work in the field. Um, it's objective, it's research-based, it's not affiliated with anybody, we just, do, we do research. And the common thread across all of it, all of it, is that providing adopted people with their own information across the spectrum of information um, serves their needs, serves the needs of their families, uh, contributes to their mental health, on and on and on. In addition to being an equity issue, which I certainly agree it is. Uh, if you're born a day too late or a day too early, it should not affect what rights you have. Um, but in terms of the evidence, the evidence is singular singular that this doing what you are pondering doing benefits everybody concerned. I'm an adopted parent. We know our kids, birth parents, everything's all right. Um, and by the way, it's not about search. Everybody can search now. You can use DNA, you can use the internet. People are meeting literally every day without a birth certificate. So why are we keeping them sealed? It's it, so the only other thing I want to say, because I, I do want to keep this very short. As you consider whether to do this or not, and as your colleagues um, in the Senate will consider whether to do this or not, please know that you're not conducting an experiment. For years, people in the Bay State have been getting their birth certificates if they were born at the right times. <laughs> um, and no harm done. Whatever, and this was uh, this was mentioned earlier today, whatever you think, if you think there are negative consequences that this could have, look at the evidence. New Hampshire to Alabama to Oregon to Illinois to New York, across the geographical spectrum, across ideologies, states have done this. And you know what has happened in all those states? absolutely nothing bad, nothing. And millions of people have gotten a piece of their souls back. At a, in the time in which we live, whether you're talking about evidence or whether you're talking about rights, how we can continue to perpetuate this inequality is beyond me. It really is, and I hope with all my heart that you can pass this legislation, advocate for this legislation, and just get it done. Thank you, Mr. Pertman. Questions for Mr. Pertman? And I'm happy to provide research. I, I submitted written testimony rather lengthy with links to research, but I'm happy to, you know, for as long as you want after the call um, to answer questions, provide research, whatever anybody wants. Thank you. 
please feel free to submit anything in writing, absolutely. And if you've provided that links, those links to research, that's terrific um, and will be very useful. And Great. just a reminder, this is not only a Senate committee, this is a joint committee. Yeah, this is, I, I caught that no. even as I was saying. Thank no, you. No, 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 no apologies. I just want to make sure because our great House partners are here with us and yep. the bill is held jointly in the House and the Senate. Uh, thank you so much. Questions for Mr. Pertman? Right, unfortunately. Okay, um, we're going to move on to Jay. Madam Chair. Bell, please. Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, okay. former Councillor um, Jackson is with us. Okay. Um, uh, we will, um, thank you so much, Mr. Jackson, you're welcome to speak. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, I know you folks up at the State House are much better with technology than, than uh, our, our, the city councilors. Um, not, I wanna, at all. not at all. Uh -huh. I want to thank um, uh, the uh, co-sponsors, uh, Sean Garberly, uh, Kate Hogan, as well as Ann, Ann Goby. Um, I am uh, privileged and honored to be here uh, today. Um, I ironically was born on April 11th, 1975. Um, I was born nine months um, almost to the day um, of um, this kind of lockout. Um, and I would submit to you, uh, for me personally, um, I just recently found my mom. Um, and my mom is actually featured in a book that I read five times in college uh, called Common Ground. I'm a history major and a sociology minor, and I will uh, admit to the uh, this August board, I only read the chapters that my mom was actually in uh, so I can do my papers. And so um, literally I read about my own birth in that book uh, multiple times, and, it, and I didn't make that connection. Um, I would also let you know that my mom was sexually assaulted she was trafficked by her mother um, and she had no choice in the adoption. And in 2011, um, after losing her middle son um, to uh, act of uh, violence, um, she uh, told her other two sons, who, my, my brothers who I've recently met, um, that she had, she had uh, another child. And um, she went in 2011, in fall, the fall 2011, to Boston City Hall to go get the uh, the birth certificate um, for baby boy Twyman. Um, ironically, she was turned away. She sat there for about two hours trying to get uh, get uh, this information. But even more ironic, I was upstairs in Boston City Hall, serving as a Boston City Councilor. So my mom and I were literally in the same place at the same time, but we did not have this information to connect us. Um, I had I paid paid my five hundred bucks to um, the Home for Little Wanderers, um, and they um, a couple of months made that connection. Not everyone has five hundred dollars. Not everyone not everyone can uh, wait for that process. And when we think about COVID, my mom uh, just got over COVID. I had COVID last year. We literally could have both missed one another based on, in this life, uh, based on this lack of information. And I will note to you, as an African American, one of the most amazing things that's happened to me in my whole life is that when I find out, found out I was part of the Twyman family, in common ground, there was a chapter that goes back to slavery. So someone who's been walking around trying to do this work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, all that good stuff, I literally instantly had a history, uh, a heritage, and a connection that I never had uh, before. And, it, and by the way, I had read it all multiple times. And so what I would ask uh, of you, listen, I, I know this is hard for some folks. One, I'm, we're, we're not here doing what I normally do, is asking you for something that costs a lot of money. That's normally why, why I come see you. Um, I'm actually, this is probably probably the first, last, and only time um, that I come and ask you for something. Uh, when it comes down to it, this is about completing ourselves. It's about public health, because how I came to this is I had a physician who pushed me around um, you know, the, you know, any of the disease states that I had. All of those things are so important. And lastly, it completed my puzzle 
Um, this year, I celebrated um, uh, the um, the um, first time, and I, I had two mothers Mother's Day situation. A little, a little bit more expensive than normal, but it's all good. Um, but uh, it was um, one of the highlights of, of my whole life. And so I, I, I thank you for the consideration. This one, I really ask for for you, guys, for you ladies, as well as uh, gentlemen, to punch this in and get it over the finish line. It's been here multiple times, but I would submit to you, I, and I heard the public health uh, 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 issues that you were talking about earlier, this is connected. I, I I thought about not being here, and my mom literally uh, two weeks ago just kicked COVID. We could have passed on this side and not been been able to see each other until the other side. I I uh, I, I I ask you, and I'll, honestly, I beg of you um, to actually um, move this this legislation forward. It is life or death. It's completion, not completion, and it helps relationships, mental health, public health, and the like. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Jackson. I really appreciate your testimony so much. Um, this Mother's Day, my son had three moms. Um, his adopt he, my wife and I adopted him and his birth mom, uh, and we celebrated all together. And it is it was a beautiful opportunity for us all to be a big sprawling family. Uh, I really appreciate the vision here and you holding it. Um, questions for Mr. Jackson? Yeah. Um, Councillor Jackson, it's great to see you. Um, Tito, I actually went to text you and then I realized my new phone did not um, upload all my old numbers. So I did hit you up on Twitter. Um, that story was so powerful in the globe. Um, and you know, just to be clear, there's no begging necessary here. The House actually, we, we enacted this bill, we voted it out. Um, it, it went over to the Senate and I have to believe, but for the um, our ability to try to figure out how to respond quickly to a pandemic that this had, I, I would have hoped that this would have gone through the Senate. I don't know that, but I would have hoped. Um, and um, Sean, Representative Sean Garvely has been talking to me about this bill for years and it really hit me because um, it's very personal to him. Um, as well. And it's just, there's something really, the fact is that nobody knows why these like arbitrary dates were chosen is a whole other conversation that somebody might want to explore. But to say that it's, um, it really is, it, it, it is, it's outrageous to begin with. There, it makes no sense. And um, just, you know, to everyone who's been on here telling their stories, it takes a lot of courage um, and heart and, um, and energy. So thank you for all of that. But um, did not want this moment to go by in a world in which we don't get to see each other in person too often right now, just to say, um, really powerful reading that and so happy for you and for your mom. And um, and I, I expect that, you know, we will be trying to move this bill through the House as well and um, and look forward to getting it out in the Senate this time, too. Thank you, Representative. Yeah, good Thank to see you, my friend. Keep safe. Good to see you, too. Thank you so much, Councillor. Uh, grateful for your testimony. And any other questions, Councillor Jackson? Okay. All right. We'll move now to J.M. Sorrell. Thank you, J.M., for letting us get uh, Councillor Jackson in. Welcome. J.M.? Am I on now? You are. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I almost live in your district. I did for most of my adult life. I'm three houses over the line. So, um, but I have a lot of admiration for you. I also just want to point quickly, and I am going to stick to a script and let and um, hold me to being under three minutes. But I used to serve as a as Granby's health agent 20 years ago. So, um, incredibly supportive of um, everything that all of the um, people in public health were speaking to earlier. And my hope after this pandemic is that our medical and public health systems work together more routinely going forward like they do in other countries rather than only in a crisis. So just had to put that plug in. But this, um, these bills in the House and Senate are personal for me. Over three years ago, when I was uh, 57 years old, I was able to get my original birth certificate from Pennsylvania. I was adopted at nine months old from a foster home. 
And while it was normative for me to be in my adoptive family, and I still maintain close, really close ties to my cousins, I was curious to know if I had birth siblings and to learn about my biological background. My adoptive parents have been deceased for 10 years, but they were always supportive um, of me wanting to learn more about my biological roots. Little did I know when I inquired, the Pennsylvania law was a day away from changing for the first time unsealing the records so that I could get my original birth certificate. Talk about timing. After paying $15 and sending in the form six weeks later, that birth certificate arrived in the mail. It was a heart opening experience to see my given name at birth and my parents' names and ages at the time of my birth. There's more to my story, but suffice it to say, I'm engaged in a relationship with my birth mother who happens to live in Cambridge, Mass. We've each lived in Massachusetts most of our adult lives. She also has lots of friends in Northampton. And she had a son at age 43, so I have a kid brother and I like him and his wife very much. I also learned about my health history and this information has actually been crucial. I was able to contact my birth father who's in California and just last month, I connected with a sister I did not know I had. She's amazing. Like me, she spent her adult life serving others and addressing societal injustices. My identity was intact in some ways before I decided to look into my roots. And yet genetic information has answered questions I didn't even know I had. It's no small thing. I believe it's a fundamental right for a person to know where she or he comes from for better or for worse. I've come to realize that it's important to know about my birth origins. And while it doesn't preclude complication and ups and downs, it's been an essential piece of my puzzle. It's not about the outcome. It's about knowing who I am more fully. Both nature and nurture are factors in each of our lives. In Massachusetts, it should not matter when you were born in order to obtain your original birth certificate. This issue has been considered for years in the legislature, and now is the time to act. Thank you for making this a priority. It's a profound and important human right. Thank you. Oops, forgive me. I was on mute for a second. I was saying thank you so much, Jay. I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to stay to testify and Thank you to you and everybody else sharing your personal stories. This bill is about a personal call to action, for sure, for so many in our Commonwealth. Questions for JM? Okay, um, we'll call the next uh, person to testify. Um, we have Claudia Darcy, please. Claudia Corrigan Darcy, forgive me. Hi. So Hi. Hi. You got me? You're good? Okay. Yep. So hi, I'm Claudia Cargan darcy um, I'm actually not a resident of the Commonwealth, but I am from New York. But I came to the Commonwealth the first time in 1987 as a pregnant woman to give birth at a Massachusetts agency. And I finished the last part of my pregnancy in Massachusetts and then did give birth there in 1987. So this bill is directly there and you are all supposed to be protecting me with this law that's there right now. The law that has been there to protect me from him. This is my son, Max, who I gave birth to in 1987 and gave up for adoption. Oh. And um, I really did not need to be protected from him cooking, kitchen uh, cooking dinner last night or that we had a wonderful Mother's Day yesterday. Um, so, as a birth mother, and not just as a single birth mother, but as someone who has spent the last 20 years doing this work, um, I was part of the team, hi Matt, in uh, New York where we passed the bill. I, I don't even know what to say anymore about passing this because I feel like I've written this committee and every one of you many letters over the past couple of years about different reasons why and where we are. And so I was reflecting on this and I was thinking, well, the law changed in 2007. We met each other for the first time in 2007. Since 2007, we've managed to do a heck of a lot of healing and that that law is still there. We've managed to get New York to open, which that was no 
small feat in itself. And yet Massachusetts still has a law that you just have to take out 13 words. You already know it works. I mean, Adam, it's lovely testimony talking about how the science makes sense. I turned to Max and I said, he's our Fauci. Um, the science works, but you know that the science works in your own state. There is no difference between someone who was born at the stroke of midnight in 74 and afterwards. It's just silly. And then I look at my four children. The other three are treated completely differently and get their birth certificates. And you cannot. And it's ridiculous. And we do not need this protection. Um, because I do have one minute left, I will say one more thing. Um, when I was 19 and scared and vulnerable, I was trusted as a person to make a choice. No one looked out for me, really. You had the laws, but I made that choice as a birth mother to place my child. Why am I now not at 53? much more knowledgeable and much more able seen as an adult who can hold up and not be protected. Like, why did I not need to be protected when I was at 19, but I need this protection now when I can say to you, no, I do not. I do not need it. I do not want it. And if I did not want to talk to him anymore, I think we could figure it out on our own without a law. I talk too much. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. Thank you, Max, um, for being here. I see that um, Vice Chair Moran has her hand up, and then we'll take questions from the committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks um, for all that those um, who have testified to really bring the life uh, to this issue. And I, I just was curious, because it seems like there is such a patriarchal undertone to this issue that was brought up, I think, by, by Claudia pretty uh, vividly. I'm just wondering if some of the researchers um, might have, or anyone really, um, some knowledge about any um, national women's organizations or Massachusetts state women's organizations, if they, whether they have sort of read into um, to this legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Both chairs, thank you. Thank you so much. We have some construction happening. If you, it, uh, okay, I think we're <laughs> maybe over. Okay, uh, Claudia, do you want to respond to that, to uh, Vice Chair Moran's critique? I can't say for sure um, off the top of my head, and maybe someone who's close to in-state, since I am New York, can talk about um, in-state organizations. I can say historically that there's actually kind of been a, a weird kind of a miss between women's organizations and then looking at what is definitely um, a patriarchal you know, establishment and um, a lack of equity in adoption relinquishment specifically. Um, there's, there's just definitely a conflict there where a lot of feminist organizations do look at adoption as a reproductive choice. And um, Unfortunately, you know, as a, a birth parent advocate, I do feel that incredibly a lot of feminist organizations have closed their eyes to the exploitation, basically, of, of young women with lack of resources and support. Um, and, and to be completely honest, it's because often the women who are in power and privileged in the feminist organizations are often adoptive parents themselves. And I, I think there is some inherent bias in it. Um, we are getting a little bit more now. I think people with understanding trauma and the child separation at the borders, I think people have been able to really jump over and, and kind of see adoption relinquishment as more of um, an equ equity issue, but we still have a very long way to go. Uh, that's kind of the general, if that helps any. Thanks so much for that response. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Any other questions? Okay, um, thank you so much to you both for being here. Grateful for your testimony and your steadfast um, advocacy around this issue in the Commonwealth. As Chair Decker said, well, this bill came out favorably last time the House actually moved it forward and we were unable to move it forward in the Senate. Senate. But I think our combined hope is that this moves forward this session as it needs to. Um, next, uh, Marley Grenier, please. Can you hear me? We can hear you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marley Greiner, and I am the executive chair and co-founder of Bastard Nation, the adoptee rights organization. We are the largest adoptee rights organization in the United States. We support only the full restoration of the right of all adopted people without restriction or condition to a copy of their original birth certificate and related documents and records. I'm also adopted. I've been involved in the movement for over 40 years, and I've had my original birth certificate from Ohio since 1981 with absolutely no social disruption. Uh, we support passage of a House Bill 2294, Senate Bill 1440, as written, and urge the Joint Committee on Public Health uh, to vote the bill favorably and, and to move it onto the floor for a favorable vote. Uh, last year, an identical bill passed the House, as you've mentioned, uh, but it was not heard in the Senate. We believe that uh, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, it would have been heard. Uh, Current Massachusetts law allows adoptees to obtain their original birth certificates without condition at age 18 if they were born on or before July 17th, 1974, or on or after July 1st, or January 1st, 2008. The OBCs of people born between those dates remain sealed, unavailable only by court, available only by court order. Uh, this bill simply levels the playing field and lets all Massachusetts adoptees be treated the same way. Uh, Fifteen years ago, Bastard Nation was closely involved in uh, the SB 959 campaign. Uh, that bill uh, would have restored the right of all Massachusetts uh, born adoptees to unrestricted uh, to be able to uh, to obtain their birth certificates uh, unrestricted without conditions. I came to Boston. I walked the halls of Beacon Hill for a few days and uh, testified on behalf of the bill before the Joint Committee on Children and Families. Uh, talking to legislators and their, and their aides, I was assured repeatedly that this bill was a no-brainer. It would pass. I, you know, don't worry about it. But then nothing happened. Uh, I left Boston confident that the bill had a good chance of passage, but said nothing happened. And after months of compromise uh, and some confusion and lack of communication uh, from legislators and sponsors, the bill uh, was passed and uh, that split Massachusetts adoptees into two classes, the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots born between the, those two dates of the haves could not, uh, could not obtain their birth certificates. Illogically, simple through an accident of, of date of birth, the have-nots found themselves and their uh, publicly held birth certificates tossed into a black hole along with their right to equal treatment and due process. Under current law, the state, the state of Massachusetts clearly understands the principle that adopted people have a right to their own original birth certificates. Uh, the state now has the opportunity to right that grave wrong that was done 15 years ago. Uh, it has a chance to level the playing field and make the rights of all the state's adopted citizens, not just some, equal to the not adopted and equal to those within their own adoptive class. Uh, please do the right thing. Support uh, support these bills, vote do pass, get them onto the floor and um, get them passed, make Massachusetts adoptees equal. Uh, and I do have a, you had a question earlier about uh, uh, feminist or women's organizations. Connecticut now supports the records bill there. Ms. Magazine has written in favor of, uh, of records access. And uh, I, I am the former vice president of Columbus, Ohio now, and we certainly supported. And I was told at one time that now actually had a resolution uh, in support of, of access. Thank you so much, Marley, and thanks for getting back to Vice Chair Moran's uh, good question. Uh, really Thank appreciate you it. very much. Uh, questions for Marley? Okay, seeing none right now. Thank you, Marley. We're going to move on to Gregory Luce, please. And forgive me if I've gotten that name wrong. I've, uh, so forgive me. No, Madam Chair, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair Comerford, um, Chair Decker, and members of the Joint Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in favor of House File 2294, Senate File 1440. My name is Gregory Luce. I'm the president of Adoptees United, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to adoptee rights. 
I'm also an attorney and the founder of Adoptee Rights Law Center, a Minnesota-based law firm where I represent adult adopted people. I'm considered a national expert on issues related to adult adopted people and their rights to identity, heritage, and citizenship. I'm also an adoptee and I have deep roots to Massachusetts. I'm a graduate of Boston University and most of my birth family has resided in Massachusetts for generations. My birth father resides in a Boston suburb and my birth mother and my maternal grandparents are buried on Martha's Vineyard where my aunt, a retired cobbler, still resides with her children and a grandchild. As we've already heard from Councillor Jackson, Senator Comerford, and Representative Garbley, and many others, millions of people and hundreds of thousands of Massachusetts residents are impacted in some way by adoption. My written testimony gives context to Massachusetts current law and its division between the haves and have nots of a state issued birth record. You have heard today from others who have talked about DNA, about the right to identity, about the shame that was used to coerce birth mothers to relinquish children in the past. You've heard that no promises of anonymity were made to birth parents, including my own, who was actually kicked out of Mount Holyoke after she being, became pregnant and was, to the dismay of school administrators, not married. Today, however, I'd like to provide additional humanizing context. Let's take two people born and adopted in Massachusetts, a brother and a sister. The girl is born in Lowell in August 1974, the boy in Somerville in late 1973. They are adopted into the same family and in Middlesex County Probate and Family Court, their adoption decrees are issued on the same exact date in 1975. Fast forward to today in which they are adults, one 48 years of age, the other 47. Their brother applies for a copy of his original birth certificate. He fills out form R109, pays $32, and within a few weeks he has a copy of his own birth record in the mail. Is a sister, adopted on the same day and in the same court, also fills out the same form, pays the same fee, but in a few weeks she gets nothing other than a letter rejecting her application because she was born in Massachusetts at the wrong time. She grew up in the same house, in the same place, with the same neighbors, and with the same parents, yet she is denied a right to her own identity. I remind this committee that Article 7 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children states unequivocally that the child shall be registered immediately after birth and shall have the right from, a birth, from birth to a name, the right to acquire a nationality, and as far as possible, the right to know and be cared for by his or her parents. A right to know who your parents are enshrined by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children. That is what is at stake here, a Massachusetts law that compromises that universal right and disallows the release of a birth record solely related to the luck of where and when you were born. Had, for instance, the adopted woman in my example have been born 20 miles away in Nashua, New Hampshire, rather than Lowell, Massachusetts, she would have been able to apply for and receive her New Hampshire original birth record without question. This is the same result in Maine, Rhode Island, New York, and other states. It's time now to make Massachusetts adopted people whole. It's time now that Massachusetts recognizes the inherent right of adult adopted people to possess their own records, their own histories, their own stories, and to claim our full autonomy as humans. We too are human, and I urge this committee to vote due pass on H2294, Senate 1440. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony and advocacy. Questions? Okay, seeing none right now. Um, thank you again, and we'll move to Catherine LaRussa, please. Hi, my name is Catherine LaRussa, and I would like to present to you why access to my original birth certificate is so important to me. From a very young age, I have known I was adopted. My origins have been a giant and distressing mystery throughout my life. Not having information on myself has caused me great heartache. I was a teenager when I first looked up the laws to obtain my original birth certificate and was absolutely devastated to find not all adoptees are granted access. I am one of those unfortunate adoptees to be born in the gap years. To know I was simply born at the wrong time to be given access to such a crucial part of me is demoralizing and cruel. I investigated further to find that I would most likely never be given access to my original birth certificate. There needed to be a good reason and someone else would decide for me if my reason was good enough or not. I've had to live the next years of my life with this pain that I may never get to know such integral information about myself 
that non-adoptees take for granted every day? What have I done differently than adoptees born before 1974 and after 2008? Adoptees born between 1974 and 2008 are not criminals, so why are we treated as so? Why do some adoptees get access to their original birth certificate and others don't? It is discrimination and completely unfair. I've had to grow up with no medical history, racial identity, or information on my origins. Imagine growing up in a family and in a, in a community that looks nothing like you, where you always feel different and like an outsider. I have now had to pay $300 for DNA, DNA tests for some sort of information about myself. If you are not adopted, you are very privileged to not know what all of these questions and heartaches feel like. My amended birth certificate erased me, and I would finally like to know the full truth about myself, what I have spent my whole life searching for. I implore you to please report favorably, favorably so access to original birth certificates for adoptees born in the gap years can soon be granted. We are no different than adoptees that were born outside of them. And I wrote that in 2019 for the other hearing. This year, I have some new information to share. This year, I have been diagnosed with a rare blood disorder and kidney disease at the age of 30. If I had access to my medical history, it is very possible these conditions could have been diagnosed earlier or even prevented. What other ailment do I have waiting for me that I don't know about? Denying me access to my birth certificate has caused me both mental and physical anguish. And I would like to thank you for your time and for this opportunity. Catherine, thank you so much. I'm so sorry for the anguish. Um, you are right. Adoptees in these gap years are no different and they deserve the same rights. Um, and thank you for continuing to raise your voice uh, so that the legislature can hear your story and take action. Very, very grateful. Um, any questions for Catherine? Okay, um, moving on. We have Etta Lappin Davis, please. Okay, can you hear me? Absolutely. Good. Honorable chairs and members of the Joint Committee on Public Health. My name is Etta Lappin Davis. I'm the coordinator of volunteer position of Access Massachusetts, a grassroots effort to restore the human right of access to their original birth certificates to all adopted persons born in the Commonwealth. Since our beginning in 2013, Access Massachusetts has heard from hundreds of adoptees waiting with bated breath for Massachusetts to give them access to their own vital records. Access Massachusetts filed legislation in 2015 and again in, subs in the subsequent two legislative sessions. The bills were reported out favorably by committees assigned for third reading and passed by the House in the last session. There is intense support for these bills, and as we try for the fourth time, it is long past time for their passage. Access Massachusetts members and supporters are grateful to the many legislators, including members of this joint committee, who have signed on to H2294S 1440. We are especially grateful to Senator Ann Gobi and Representatives Kate Hogan and Sean Garbley for sponsoring. We submitted several additional documents, our frequently asked questions, position statements in support of access to birth certificates from prestigious national organizations, and a letter of support from the Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproduction Attorneys written in support of our previous filing. Access Massachusetts believes that current Massachusetts law is discriminatory because it denies adoptees born in the gap years access to their original birth certificates without a court order. These bills are about restoring the human right for all persons born in Massachusetts between those dates to obtain non-certified copies of their original birth certificates from the Registry of Vital Records. It is our fervent belief that all adopted persons should have the same right as all other citizens of Massachusetts. Access Massachusetts believes there can be no rational justification for granting access to an original birth certificate to someone born on one date while denying the same human right to someone born a day, a month, or a year later. 
These bills are purely and simply about ending discrimination against adopted persons who were born in Massachusetts during the gap years and about treating people equally. We urge you to champion equality and report out favorably on H2294, S1440. Access Massachusetts stands ready to assist the committee as you consider these bills. Please contact us if additional information from us would be helpful. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you so much, Etta. Question for Etta. Okay, I don't see any at this time. Thank you. Um, and I see a thanks to you in the chat, Etta, um, for your leadership. Um, at this you. moment, I'd just like to see if anyone else uh, came to the hearing um, hoping to testify. We have no one else listed um, today to testify. Okay, um, I don't see anyone. I, I want to thank again the last slate of folks who have come, taken your time, told your stories um, about this important piece of legislation. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff uh, who really uh, made the whole hearing run. Uh, please remember that we accept written testimony, so please don't hesitate to send in any additional information. Uh, and I'll take a motion to adjourn from one of my committee members. So moved. Thank you so much. Um, with that, we will adjourn and take good care, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chairs.